الحمد لله وكفى والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعض فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام ميم الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم نزل عليك الكتاب الحق مصدقا لما بين يديه وأنزل التوراة والإنجيل من قبل هدى للناس وأنزل, وأنزل الفرقان إن الذين كفروا بآيات الله لهم عذاب شديد سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم uh, so as you're well aware, the, um, the verses that I just recited are the very first and initial verses of Surah Al-Imran. Um, we completed Surah Al-Baqarah last, at the last gathering, and uh, so now we're going to move on to this uh, series of verses. One, um, one important point is that it's always a great blessing. So as I was saying, uh, it's, a very, it's always a great blessing to be able to end something, and it's always a great bless- blessing to be able to begin something. So Alhamdulillah... At our last gathering, we were able to complete uh, Surah Al-Baqarah after many, many years. And uh, and then today, we were able to begin something new. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He grant us the, uh, the benefits of that which we completed. And He grant us the benefits of that which we're, we're about to begin. So, um, the very first verse here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He states, Alif Lam Mim. And um, very, this is a very interesting because we began Surah Al-Baqarah that way and now we're beginning um, Surah Al-Imran this way, exact same way. Remember that Alif Lam Mim, these are called, I can actually test you if I had to, right? Because <laughs> we'd see who remembered what from the very beginning. But huruf al, uh, these Alif Lam Mim, these are called Huruf Al-Muqatta'at. Huruf Al-Muqatta'at, these mean the cut-off letters. The cut-off letters. And uh, why are they the cut-off letters? Because... You say them individually, you know, alif, lam, mim. So you say each letter individually. Now remember from our discussion at the very beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, it's almost like a full circle. Uh, at that point I told you that these verses, they have, they are verses of the Qur'an and they have the power, the spiritual power of a verse of the Qur'an. Uh, and the example that I gave you, uh, or the proof of that, which I gave you at that time and which I'll give you again, is that you've heard the famous hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where he explained to his companions that every single um, letter of the Quran it has benefit. Every letter has reward associated with it. And um, the Prophet alaihi salam, he explained that every time a harf of the Quran is recited, you get ten rewards. And then when he was giving the example to highlight to the companions the power of the Quran, he said that. You know, la akul alif harfun la that he stated that alif harfun walam harfun wa mim harfun that alif is a harf walam is a harf wa mim is a harf. So that basically what was being highlighted was that when a person recites alif la mim that each individual harf alif harfun walam harfun wa mim harfun each of these is a letter and each receives ten rewards. So that. Just by merely stating alif lam mim, a person re- receives ten blessings. Now, the other derivative discussion that arises from this point is that when a person recites these, one of the agreed principles concerning these types of verses, the huruf al-muqattat, is that nobody knows the meaning. No scholar can ever tell you the meaning of what is alif lam mim. What does it mean? What's the translation? There is no translation. What is the significance? Nobody knows for certain. However, it's interesting that when Rasulullah wanted to establish the benefits of the Qur'an, he gave the example of Alif Lam Mim, showing that even if a person were to recite three letters from the Qur'an and have no idea what they meant, because nobody in the world knows what these letters mean, they still receive 30 blessings for reciting those three letters. So this is the inherent power of the Qur'an, that even if you recite it and have no idea what you're reciting, no idea what you're reciting, you still receive benefits from it. Now, of course... If you want to multiply those benefits, the greater, uh, the greater good would be that you learn the language of the Qur'an, you learn the tajweed of the Qur'an, you give, its, you give due diligence to the Qur'an, and that you learn the meanings of what you're reciting. That only empowers you further. But 
It should never, the argument should never be made that because I don't understand the Quran, I'm not going to read it. That argument doesn't hold weight. Because the Prophet ﷺ already established that the minimum reward is for, is 30 rewards for, is 10 rewards for each letter with no meaning. 10 rewards of each le- for each letter with no meaning. So that's an important point that we gather from Alif Lam Mim. What the meaning is, nobody knows. There's so many, so many different opinions. Some people say it's the opinion of the scribe that, inscri- that, were, that was writing these verses as the Prophet ﷺ was dictating them. Some people say that this is a particular the communication that occurred between Allah and His Messenger and that the secret was made between Allah and His Messenger and that we are not to ever know what the meaning actually is. Again, these debates can go on and on. The point is nobody knows the meaning. And the point is that you receive ten rewards for each letter despite not knowing the meaning. So that's the take home. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, Allahu la ilaha illahu. So one Nissan dark gray. You, uh, you left your lights on. X86-1306. Lights are on. Allahu la ilaha illahu. That Allah, la ilaha, there is no deity worthy of worship, illahu, except him. So I always say that, you know, when you, when you have a whole series of verses in the Quran, when you recite the Quran, there's many, many types of verses that arise. Some of the verses are the verses that deal with legal aspects of Islam. Some of the verses are deal, deal with creation. Some of the verses deal with Jahannam. Some of the verses deal with Jannah. Some of the verses deal with the history of the people that came before. And then there's some verses, they're like the cream of the, the, the cream at the top of the milkshake. You know, the, the, that very, very special cream, which discuss Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those are very special verses. Why? Because there was no other way to come to this point except that Allah discuss Himself. See, our mind could never comprehend Allah. <coughs> Yet, these verses, they give us information about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He describes Himself in His own words. So when Allah describes Himself in His own words, that is like the ecstasy for the believer. Because that's the ultimate discussion. To discuss Allah Himself. To learn about the magnificence of Allah, the grandeur of Allah, the greatness of Allah. And that's what's special about these types of verses. So, that's what's going to happen in this series that we're going to discuss today. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing Himself. Allah he starts with the most, his most beautiful name. La ilaha. There is no deity worthy of worship. Illahu. Just so to the point. You know, it just nail, it just hits to the, gets you right to the point of the matter. There is no deity worthy of worship. Illahu. Now it's a very big statement. You're saying Allah, you know, He is the Lord. There is no deity worthy of worship except Him. So anytime you make a big statement, it's always stated that if you talk to a lawyer or you talk to anybody who understands argument, the general principle of argumentation is if you make a big statement, you need a big proof, right? This is always the general principle of, uh, of making statements. You say something really outrageous, then you better produ- produce a similar outrageous proof in order to back it up. So when you make such a statement that Allah, la ilaha illahu, then what's the proof? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself provides the proof within the statement by saying, Allah, la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum. And then that becomes the proof, and it becomes a description also. So what's the proof? He says, al-hayyul qayyum. That Allah, there is no deity worthy of worship except him, al-hay al-qayyum. Al-hay means what? The living. Now, from that we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the living and He is permanent. He is living from the from before the beginning of time until after the end of time. Now you think about every single thing that you know has a beginning and an end. Every single thing that you know has a beginning and an end. For example, you have a beginning and an end. Every animal that's present has a beginning and an end. The earth had a beginning. You know, you can study the science of the earth and where it came from. The earth will have an end. Uh, Everything in creation. The one characteristic, one of the characteristics that separates all of creation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that all of creation has some beginning and some end. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no beginning and has no end. He's everlasting. He's alive. He's living. He's the true life. the The true living one. So this statement is a very big statement because now you sit down and think, you say, okay, so I'm going to worship someone. There's no deity worthy of worship and I have to pick a deity. There has to be a deity that, that, that makes themselves worthy of worship. So how can I distinguish everything in the world from Allah? 
And this is this one word, al hay distinguishes everything from Allah. Why? Because every single thing has a beginning, every single thing has an end, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no beginning and no end. He was there from whatever beginning you start, he actually was before that. And whatever end there will be, he will persist beyond that. There is no bound to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence. So that's unique. right? It clearly makes a demarcation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything else. So very powerful one word. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, Al-Hayyul Qayyum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is sustaining. Now you think about everything in the world, it requires the sustenance in the world. You require sustenance. Okay, human beings require sustenance, whether they be the, you know, the president of a country or whether they simply be the person working in the street. Every human being requires sustenance. And every living thing requires sustenance. Every animal requires sustenance. All of the world around us requires sustenance. The trees require sustenance. So that again makes a clear demarcation between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the rest of existence. So these two words are very powerful because we say that they are proofs within the statement. You know, they, they help to clarify the statement. They help to empower the statement because it, it, it's, it's so succinct. Look, it's just a few words. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum. Such a few words. Yet in those words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala established tawheed, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the fact that He is the only deity worthy of worship, and gave two essential reasons why. And two characteristics of Himself, which establish why. Al-hayyul qayyum. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, Nazzala alayka al-kitab bil haq that he revealed upon you, now he's talking to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and all of us are basically listening. So we're the observers. نَزَّلَ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ بِالْحَقِّ He revealed the book upon you in truth. That this book that was revealed upon you, that this book is truth. مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ It is a verifier it is a verifier for that which came before it. Wa anzala Torah, and he revealed the Torah wa Injil, and he also revealed the Injil. Now, basically, what this verse is establishing is that it's creating a link between the Quran and the prior books that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealed. That's basically the, the goal of this verse, and that is a very powerful link that sometimes we don't appreciate. When we think about the in the in the context of where we exist now, look. If you look at trends, I will tell you that every 20 years, every 20 to 30 years, there's a new trend. Okay, like there's a new trend in fashion. There's a new trend in uh, in entertainment. There's a new trend in uh, culture. There's a new trend. It, you see, it's constantly shifting. People are always shifting. If you look at life 50 years ago, it looks very different than life today. And if you look at life 50 years before that, it looks very different than life 50 years ago. This is the nature of human beings. It's always shifting. And ideas are shifting. You'll see that the dominant idea at one point becomes the completely opposite at another point. I mean, if you were in America 100 years ago, then you would have seen that slavery was a very predominant thing. And people accepted it. They accepted it like it was A and B. They accepted it the same way they accepted the alphabet. They accepted slavery. And then you come back into America and you come a hundred years later and it's completely rejected, right? And you see that there's a new liberty, there's a new equality that has been established. And again, this is all happens with the passing of time. Now you think about movements and you think about ideologies and you think about ideas. You know, today it's democracy, tomorrow it's this, it's always changing. You know, communism 50 years ago, democracy today, then somebody will have some new idea in 50 years. But which ideology can you say has lasted thousands of years, thousands of years, and has been connected by people that were clearly disconnected? Okay, for example, you look at communism. There were a few founders of communism, then there were a few people that followed them, and they, they propagated the ideology, and then they pass away. And when they pass away, communism goes with them. It's not going to be that a thousand years from now somebody's going to come up with communism again and then another thousand years somebody's going to come up with communism again. That doesn't happen. Because these are, these are disparate. They are separate ideologies. 
But the unique thing about the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Tawheed is that there have been, there, since the beginning of human creation, there has been a continuous theme scattered across time and place of worshiping Allah, messengers being sent, and books being revealed. And they all taught the same thing. The same deen, the essential same premise that Adam alayhi salam brought is the same premise that Isa alayhi salam brought, that Musa alayhi salam brought, that Ibrahim alayhi salam brought, that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam brought. And it's, it's the same idea. It's the same idea. They called to the same Allah. They, called, they reminded people of the same Jannah. They warned people of the same Jahannam. They reminded people of accountability in this life. This was a perpetual theme that spread across time and place. Thousands of years, the same theme was brought up. And in different regions of the world. One prophet was sent here, another prophet was sent there. They never knew each other. They never had each other's writings. Nothing was preserved. Each one was sent after the prior religion died. The Prophet ﷺ was sent when the prior religion had become completely effaced, from the, when the truth of it had become completely effaced. Then it was rejuvenated with a new prophet, rejuvenated with a new prophet, rejuvenated with a new prophet. But they all called to the exact same thing. Where in history can you see such a firm foundation that you can stand on the, you can stand on the ideology that existed from the beginning of time, from the beginning of human creation? Now you see that sometimes people feel, as Muslims in particular, we feel that we're standing on a very weak ground. Because we feel like we're the minority, and we feel like we have the, uh, that the ideology and the notions that we present, that they're very foreign. But I would argue the other way. I would say that we stand on, dec on centuries of, of we, not centuries, we stand on millennia. We stand on, we stand on millen millennia of history. We are, we are the ones that are standing on the same message that was brought by Adam alayhi salam and the same message that has been sealed by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we're standing on thousands of years of history, thousands of years of tradition, and they all taught the same thing. So who's standing on solid ground? We or the people who have come up with some new notion and they're presenting that today and tomorrow it will change. You see that there is no, there, there is no static uh, notion in the, in the way the world functions. It's so dynamic, they're constantly changing, even their own rules. You see, one, one church is saying one thing 10 years ago, and now they say another thing. Well, you know, 20 years ago, it was, it was not permissible to marry the person of the same gender, and now it is permissible in that church to marry the person of the same gender. So how could that religion change? How could it be possible that 20 years ago you said one thing, and 20, now today you say another thing, when it was all based on revelation? When the revelation hasn't changed, your messenger already came and left. So all these things are constantly changing. We are the ones who are standing on a very, very firm, solid base. We should never, we should never feel that we're in the minority. We're actually in the majority in the global span of creation. You, you know, yes, in this little window of 2011, standing here in Chicago, yes, we exist in the minority. But in the global spread of the earth, across the entire time of human beings, we're actually standing on the most solid footing. Because we're standing on the same revelation that all of our forefathers stood on, which were the same people that are respected within all cultures across humanity. So we should be very, very confident in what we have to say, and we should be very firm and say this is what we believe. Not that we have to force the belief on anyone else, but we should be very clear. These are the things we believe. These are the things we were told to believe, and we feel very comfortable about them. We're not ashamed about them. And you see that there is some sunan, for example, that every prophet followed. You know, you can go through hadith and the Prophet ﷺ says that every single prophet did these things. And they're listed in the hadith, okay? The, the lifestyle of all of the prophets. And for thousands of years, people are living like this. And all of a sudden, it changes just in this recent time because we've been swept away by, you know, by distance from that tradition. So we should be very comfortable in who we are. And that's exactly what's happening here in this particular verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to Rasulullah so I said, look, nazzada alayka. It was revealed upon you. So who's the conversation between Allah and Rasulullah so I said, and we're just watching. We're just innocent bystanders watching the conversation. So Allah says to the messenger, nazzada alayka al-kitab. We have revealed this book upon you. You shouldn't feel like it's anything new. Now the kuffar were saying what? They were saying you have no basis. You brought something new. Our forefathers didn't have this. This is, we never heard of such a thing. Where did this come from? You must be a madman now, 
But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was telling Rasulullah sallallahu look globally. Look beyond just what these people are saying. Nazzala alayka al-kitab. We have revealed upon you a book. And we have revealed that in truth. And what's the characteristic of that book? Musaddiqan lima bayna yadayh. It is a verifier of that which was sent before it. And which books are those? The books that you all know about. Even the Arabs knew at the time, the Kufar knew that there was a book called the Injil and the Torah. And that this book is a verifier of those books. The same message brought in those books is the same message brought in this book. And everything that was predicted in those books is now being revealed in this book. I.e., the Prophet ﷺ was predict- predicted. And much of what was going to occur with the Muslim community, various acts were predicted. And they were obviously revealed in the Qur'an. So, again, that's the, it's an important reminder and it's an important uh, foundation upon which Rasulullah ﷺ stood, that he actually was part of this amazing tradition and that tradition has existed over such a long period of time. And we should also be proud of that tradition. We should recognize where we come from. We're not just some... Uh, you know, as they say, we're not just the chaff that blew off because the wind blew us this way and that way. We actually come with tradition. We come with an enormous tradition. We connect to Adam alayhi salam and Musa alayhi salam and Ibrahim alayhi salam and Isa alayhi salam and all of the great things that they did. And the same message, that's the message we carry. We are very solid. We are, we are grounded. We are firmly grounded. These roots, they don't get blown by the wind. You know, you got a little bit of a twig and you put it in the ground. The wind blows it this way and that way. You have a deep tree that has been growing and growing and growing for hundreds of years. The tornado comes, it stands. We, we, we will be standing when the tornado comes. And the tornado is here, actually. You know, the Dean tornado is here. It's just ripping people out. And you see the people that are sort of weak in their, in their understanding of this tradition and are, want, are, are not comfortable with this tradition, they get blown away. But we should embed ourselves in the tradition because that is the strength at this difficult time. You know, it's like in the in the tsunami, you always seek high ground, right? They always say, and we're very we're very aware of this in this day and age. There's a tsunami. The first thing they warn you: go seek high ground. Same thing. We are seeking very high ground. We're standing on the highest ground. We're very comfortable. As this tsunami comes and has been ripping people away from faith, we stand on a very high ground and we're very comfortable with that. So anyway. نزل عليك الكتاب الحق مصدقا لما بين يديه وأنزل التوراة والإنجيل توراة والإنجيل. Then Allah subhanahu wa taala continues من قبل هدى للناس that this came these books came before and they came before for a very simple purpose and what was that purpose هدى للناس in order to guide mankind وأنزل الفرقان and we've now revealed the فرقان the criterion this is another name for the Quran. It is a criterion. It separates those people. It does, it's a criterion, a furqan, a, a distinguisher from, for, in many aspects. It distinguishes the good from the bad. It distinguish, distinguishes that which should be worshipped from that which should not be worshipped. It distinguishes this life from the next. It distinguishes the good from the bad. It distinguishes this, this revelation from all other revelations, etc. So it's called the furqan. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a very firm warning. And some of these warnings are very scary that are coming in this particular set of ayat. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ لَهُمْ أَذَابٌ شَدِيدٌ وَاللَّهُ عَزِيزٌ ذُمْتِقَامٌ Verily, those make it very clear. You want one summary? You want one summary from this tradition? Here's a, sim- here's a simple summary of this tradition. Which is that when you stand up against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's word, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take you to account for it. And He will hold you to account on the Day of Judgment. And there will be no holding back His punishment on that day. This is a central theme that existed in every one of the messages that the prophets brought. And that this is the warning that's given to all of the people who are seeking to listen. In the ladina kafaru, verily those people who, in the ladina kafaru, those people who deny bi ayatillah, the verses of Allah, the signs of Allah, lahum adabun shadid. For them is a severe punishment. Now, you know, I tell you, I'm gonna, you, 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 you know, you, you want to warn someone. You tell your child. You're talking to your child. You say that, you know, don't do that, or you're gonna get punished, right? You get upset. Don't do that, or you're gonna get punished. They really, they really push you off to the edge, and you know, they're really doing something wrong. You say, do not do that. I'm really gonna punish you, right? You tell them I'm really gonna punish you, and because you're the parent. And because you have the power to punish, 
that straightens them out. They get worried, right? Or you can really even make it firm. I'm going to severely punish you like I've never punished you before if you don't listen to me, right? And that, again, pushes them one step forward because they see you as a source of authority and they see you as having an ability to punish. And when you put the word severe at before your punishment, that really wakes them up and it jolts them. What do you think about when the word Allah uses the word severe? What do you think about when Allah uses the word severe? SubhanAllah. Allah only had to say that he would punish us. If he would have simply said he would punish us, punish us that, would have been, that would have been frightening enough. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying what? That he has prepared lahum adabun shadid. Just imagine what that must be. What, what is severity in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What type of punishment has been prepared? Wallahu azizun bun diqam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the is is Aziz and he dhun tiqam. He is the possessor of retribution. He is the possessor of retribution. Inna Allah la yakhfa alayhi shay. There is not a single thing that can be hidden from Allah. Exactly what you're thinking, Allah knows. The motivations, what drives you to do what you do, Allah knows. Not only does he know what you do, he knows the motivation behind it. He knows why you do it. He knows your motive. He knows exactly what you intend and he will take you to account for it. There is no hiding. It's all based on sincerity. And you just imagine, look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes such a tight statement here. Inna Allah la yakhfa alayhi shay. There is not, fil ardu wa la fil sama. There is nothing from, that is hidden from Allah in the earth or in the skies. Every bug that moves, every bug that moves, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that it's moving. Every bacteria that divides, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that it's dividing. You know, just imagine, you know, how many billions, you know, just within your human system, just within yourself, you have billions of bacteria lining your gut, lining your lung, etc. They all live there. It's part of the existence of a human being. Allah knows each and every bacteria when it divides. <laughs> what type of accounting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has? Just think. He knows every single person in this room exactly what they're doing. He knows what's going on in our minds. He knows what we do, what we what we're doing this moment. He knows what we'll do the next. How how vast Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's ability to perceive must be, that at any given moment He knows every single one of His creation and exactly the status at which it's functioning, and He knows the next moment exactly where it will be. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has that type of power. And we can't perceive, you know, you listen from one ear and somebody starts talking to you at the other ear and you tell him, wait, I can't hear two people at one time. What's wrong with you? You know, I got to listen to one thing at one time. If somebody asks you to look there, you can't look there. Somebody asks you to stand on one foot, you can't raise the second foot. You know, you're facing this way, you can't see behind you. Your ability to perceive is zero. It's, it's zero. There are billions of bacteria floating around in the sky right here. There is dust floating everywhere in, the, in, this, in, this, in this room. You would not be able to see if there was no dust in this room. There has to be dust in this room because the light is hitting the dust, which is why you can see. When you go in outer space, it's dark. Have you ever seen pictures of outer space? It's pitch dark despite, despite the fact that the sun is right there. Why is outer space pitch dark and why is the ground lit? The ground is lit because there's dust everywhere. There's no dust in space. So the light passes through space and doesn't hit the dust, and so it's pitch dark. Yet when you're on the ground, the light hits the dust in the air, and that light scatters, which creates the light that we see. So we can't see any of that dust. We cannot perceive that there's billions and billions of particles of dust floating around, which allow us to see. We can't even perceive that much. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is, is cognizant of every single thing, subhanAllah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, In Allah la yakhfa alayhi shay. He's not even saying that he sees everything. He's saying there is nothing hidden. There is nothing hidden from him. That automatically assumes that in every way possible he perceives it. Whether it be the making of a noise, or whether it be the reflection of a wave, or whether it be the the seeing of what goes on, etc. In Allah la yakhfa alayhi shay. There is nothing that is hidden from him. Fil aru in the entire earth, wala fil sama, and neither in the skies. Huwa alladhi yusawwirukum fil arham kifa yasha. He is the one who fashions you in your wombs the way he designed. He is the one that fashions you in your wombs the way he designed. Now I will tell you 
you can lay, you can take all of creation from the history of man till the end of man and every single person looks different ajeeb ajeeb first of all it's amazing that allah even created us right i mean if allah were to create one human being that would be mesmerizing look at the intricacy of this human being he can talk, he can speak, he can move, he wants to move his hand this way, he moves his hand this way, he wants to pull his hand back, he pulls his hand back, he perceives the world around him, he integrates sense and he integrates the sensory world with the motor world, and he makes movements based on that integration. The human being is so complex. So complex. And it forms from one drop. SubhanAllah, one drop of fluid, two drops of fluid come together. From that, a simple cell is formed. That one cell multiplies billions of times in the dark. There's no light. There's nobody watching what's going on. There's no manager making sure that everything moves appropriately. That one cell multiplies to two, two to four, four to eight, eight to 16. You produce this little clump of cells. And one cell, the hand, the cell of the finger knows to go here. The cell of the eye knows to go here. The cell of the fingernail knows to go here. Each cell is producing the proteins necessary for it to produce. And human being becomes made perfectly. When was the last time somebody had a child and it came out and you said, oh, you know, well, this fingernail, it was too, you know, there wasn't enough time to make this fingernail. So this fingernail wasn't ready, but everything else was ready. The, the child came out. The child come out, it comes out, it comes out perfect. It comes out perfect. The fingernail is where it should be. The hair is where it should be. You don't say the hair ended up here. You know, now there was a mistake. There's no mistake. Every time Allah fashions the human being in the most perfect way. And now you think about such a complex creation. Once somebody figures out how to make something so intricate, then they don't make different ones. They replicate the same thing a million times. You know, I mean, it's unfortunate that we have to use this example, but in the technological world, when they produce an iPhone, then they make the same iPhone and they just replicate it, replicate it, replicate it, and they send the one to you, one to me, one to this person. And that's supposed to be a technological feat. Right? And they don't change it. They offer very few specifications, but they're all specifications based on the same product. And imagine that they're just, that is supposed to be innovation, and it's supposed to be the peak of innovation, and all they do is copy it over and over and over and over and over again. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates a human being. He fashions it out of nothing, in the dark, with nobody watching. Nobody watching. It's just happening by itself in the dark. It's for, cell after cell after cell is forming. You don't have to check every day, did you do your job? Did you form? Did you reach this stage? Did you reach that stage? It just happens by itself. And when it comes out, every single one is different. Amazing. Amazing. That I can look at each person and they look totally different than the next. I can look at Zayd. Zayd looks like Zayd. Abdullah looks like Abdullah. And there is no other Zayd ever created. He's absolutely unique from every other human being ever made. The fingerprint of each human being is totally distinct. The genetic material, there is no two human beings that have the exact same genetic material except that Allah programmed that way by making them identical twins. They're the exact same, but still they're different. They have different personalities, and there's always some physical difference that allows the parents to tell that this is twin A and this is twin B. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ability to create is so amazing that it starts with one cell, creates a human being, and every human being comes out different. Every human being comes out different. And where, 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 where is such an example in, in the history of creation? Only Allah can do that. And look at now Allah's statement that, you know, هُوَ الَّذِي يُسَوِّرُكُمْ فِي الْأَرْحَامِ كَيْفَ يَشَاءُ SubhanAllah. He is the one that fashioned you in the wombs the way He designed. Now I'll tell you the most ajeeb thing. Not only did Allah create you in the forward manner, that you started from a cell, and then He causes you to be created, and then perfects you in whoever you're going to be. But then he causes you to grow, causes you to die, puts you back into the ground. You're completely dissipated back into the environment from which you came, and he will raise you backward on the day of judgment to completely rebuild you from nothing. Where, where, where is such... Um, so amazing. And you know what's interesting? Is that actually it totally makes sense scientifically as well. Because every single cell has the exact same genetic machinery. The only difference is that in one cell you're running one program, in the other cell you're running the other program. I mean, the cell in my head, the cell on my skin has the same genetic material that the cell in my liver has, 
The only difference is this cell is running one genetic program and this cell is running another genetic program. But now you've seen the scientists are able to take the cell of the skin and reverse it so that it can actually make the cell of a liver, right? Because they back up its genetic program and they re-express the genes of a, another organ. So it makes total sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could take any cell of a human being and actually reverse the programming and exact, recreate them exactly the way they were. It's so much more understandable in this day if you want to imagine it that way. You know, if, if there's a bone, even one bone retained of you, then it's, potential, it's, it's theoretically possible that your genetic material would be retained there. But anyway, the point is that the same way that Allah made you, he, he will reverse you and make you up again. It's amazing. It's amazing the ability of Allah to create that he does it twice with the same person. He raises this person named Zayd, then he allows this person to pass away and re go back into the grave, and then on the day of judgment he will re-raise the same Zayd, subhanAllah, and there will be no difference. You know, that's what the magicians do, they just make something disappear and they make it reappear, and it's just a joke, it's all illusion. But this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, هُوَ الَّذِي يُسَوِّرُكُمْ فِي الْأَرْحَامِ كَيْفَ يَشَاءُ He is the one who fashioned you in the womb the way he designed La ilaha illahu. Now again, the same statement. If, if it wasn't enough to say it the first time, right? We started with what? Allahu la ilaha illahu. Now, if that wasn't sufficient at that point for you to wake up and recognize it, then he gives you all of these proofs that basically attract you towards Allah, and then makes the final again statement, same thing. La ilaha illahu. You know, if that if you if you're not listening and it's not sufficient to wake you up, then you're tone deaf. What can we do? You know, if there's an amazing thing that happens and you don't see it, then whose fault is it? Is it the fault of the miracle or is it for the fault of you? It's the fault of you, not the miracle. So if you're not able to pick, if you're not able to perceive this, then the only fault lies with you. It doesn't lie with Allah. Allah is, I mean, Allah is having this earth constantly generate new human beings and we're walking around blind. I, it should be that I come into the masjid and I should just look around and I should fall on the ground in such stuff. I should fall on the ground and sajda because I should just think that out of one drop, each of these people was created. And it was totally pitch dark in the womb. Nobody was there to fashion the human being. And everyone was made differently, such that I can identify them separately. SubhanAllah. Only Allah can do that. No company in the world. Which comp motor company in the world makes a different car each time they make the car? They wouldn't be able to do it. They would go bankrupt. Can Ford make a different car each time it makes one car and never make that car again so that you can say that I have this car and nobody else has that car? No, it's impossible. Even you go to you know any place you go, you go somebody serves you food, they cook the same food eventually. There's just a limit. There's a limit to the diversity and the, and the vastness of what people are able to create. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so amazing that I can go to Mecca Sharif and I see people from all over the world, and none of them resemble the other. Not one resembles the other. You stare for hours and hours and hours, and each one is different than the last. Each one is totally different. None of them looks the same. I can identify one by one by one, and Allah will hold us all to account that way on the Day of Judgment. It will be very clear that this was this person, this was this person, this was this person. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, La ilaha illahu, there is no deity worthy of worship except Him. Huwa al-Aziz al-Hakim. He is the Aziz and he is the wise. Huwa al-Ladhi anzala alayk al-Kitab. Now that he caught your attention, and if this wasn't sufficient to catch your attention, then we're tone deaf. Now Allah says, Huwa al-Ladhi anzala alayk al-Kitab. He is the one. This Allah, the same Allah that manages to fa fashion so many different human beings and in such an amazing way, He also did another thing. Right now, because it's all it's, it's it's understandable to us how we came from the womb. So now this point takes us to the next point, which is that huwa ladi anzala alayk al kitab. He is the one that revealed the book upon you. This same Allah that created you in such diversity and created you in this most amazing way, and who knows who from whom nothing is hidden in the skies and in the earth. He is the one. This is the one that has revealed upon you this book. So look at I mean imagine that the Sunday the the. The comfort. Imagine the comfort that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is receiving. Huwa al-ladhi anzala alayka al-kitab minhu ayatun muhkamat. In the Quran, he is the one that revealed upon you the book. In it are established very clear ayat. Hunna ummul kitab. They are the mother of the book. They are the foundation of the book. They are the pillar of the book. 
wa ukharu mutashabihat and other verses which are um, which are allegorical let's put it that way fa amma alladhina fi qulubihim zayl as for those people that have crookedness in their heart fa yattabi'una ma tashabaha min they follow that which is unclear within it if min hubtiga al fitna seeking fitna wa ibtiga ta'wili seeking an explanation okay look basically allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that he revealed this book after establishing who he is he then states that he revealed this book then he explains to us that there are two types of verses in the book there is one type of verse which is very clear and just says exactly what is is intended to be said and then there are other verses that are not as clear they have meaning but they're not as clearly stated and they provide a meaning but it's a more more it's it's a less clear and more of a vague meaning it's like an allegorical type of meaning so for example in some verses of the quran allah states allah la ilaha illahu there's no discussion there allah there's no deity worthy worthy worship except him so there's nothing unclear there you know it's such a clear pinpoint direct statement right now so you read that statement and it's very clear then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another place in the book says that um that for example isa alayhi salam is ruhullah okay now there you can start saying what does that mean ruhullah so then you can ask the question what is the ruh of allah is that part of allah is it different than allah so is isa alayhi salam part of allah is he dist- is he distinct from allah is he is this proving is, is somebody can take this and say this proves the trinity right this is showing you that this is the spirit of god and so therefore this must be a part of god and people will begin to make all these different explanations based on this 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 one word ruh allah but the point is that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created some ayat or has revealed some ayat that are very established they're very clear so when he says allah la ilaha illallah it means there is only one deity worthy of worship and that is allah okay and then these are the ummul kitab hunna ummul kitab these are the foundation of the book these are the verses upon which you make your rulings the verses upon which you establish your deen then there are other verses that mean something but you don't understand what they mean and they're designed that way so when allah says that isa alayhi salam is the ruh of the kitab uh, sorry the ruh of allah then basically what you have to take from that is that you have to interpret that verse in the context of these clear verses because the clear verses are the foundation of the book so when you interpret this the fact that isa alayhi salam is ruh allah it has meaning we don't know exactly what it means but we certainly know it does not mean that there is a partner with allah right we won't misinterpret that statement now the foundation of this discussion what time is it shah 9:45 9:45 now the foundation of this discussion is that um there were a group of christians that came to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and when they came to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam they asked rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam about their beliefs and the prophet alayhi salam he clearly established tawhid in his discussion with them then they began to pick on this point now it was very clear what he had stated and he made his statements very clear then they began to pick on this point that what about isa alayhi salam what do you mean when you say that he's the ruh of allah and if he's the ruh of allah then does that not mean that he is you know derived from allah etc etc and they started picking on this point so in the context of that discussion these verses were revealed where it was made very clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has some verses that are clear and those are the very distinct verses by which we take our deen however at the same time there are some verses that are more vague they're more allegorical and so therefore we take those verses but we interpret them in the context of that which is clear that's the way that you make those interpretations so Allah states this very clearly now let's read it in the with that background in mind who wa allazi anzala alayka alkitab he is the one that revealed upon you the book minhu ayatun muhkamat in it are very established and clear verses hunna ummul kitab these are the foundation of the book wa ukharu mutashabihat and there are other verses that are less clear fa amma alladhina fi qulubihim zayl as for those people that have in their hearts crookedness fa yattabi'una ma tashaba min they're going to go after the, the verses that are less clear they're going to start trying to grab their own interpretation from that which is less clear because they don't want to listen to the truth they want to establish that which they want to establish they're not reading it to get the answer they're reading it to find their answer there's a difference one is one thing is that you use a book and you ask it what is it telling me another thing is you look at a book and you say how can i prove that which i want to say there's a difference 
So here it's being made very clear that they're basically chasing after those things that are vague for their own purposes. And as for those people that have crookedness in their heart, they follow that which is less clear from within it. Why? They're seeking fitna. They're seeking to establish that which is already in their mind. They're not looking for the truth. And they're seeking their, their own interpretation. Or they're seeking the interpretation or their own interpretation. Or they're seeking this... The, or they're seeking just the fun of interpreting. You know, there's some people, they don't want to ever come to any conclusion, they just love to debate and talk. They just want to discuss and talk, discuss and talk, discuss and talk. You sit down, you sit down at a dinner, and then people say that, uh, oh, so you know, brother, what is your view on organ transplantation? Okay, now you look at the person, now you say, are you an organ transplant surgeon? Say, no, I'm not an organ transplant surgeon. I say, oh, okay, are you working for the Organ Donation Society? No, 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 I don't work for the Organ Donation Society. Well, are you in the need of an organ transplant? No, 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 I don't. Oh, does your family member need an organ transplant? No. So why do you want to talk about it? Oh, brother, it's just an interesting question. I just wanted to discuss this, uh, this idea with you. What do you think? I'm asking everybody what, I, what they think. I'm just uh, interested in talking about it. Why do you have to talk about things that are unclear? Right? There's a, this is a debated issue. It's one of the debated issues in the deen. There are some very clear answers. If you need an organ transplant to save your life, then the ulama give permission for that. But there are some discussions and debates there as well. What's the purpose of discussing these things? To make it entertainment, right? See, what I'm saying is that there are some people that seek ta'wil for the purpose of ta'wil, not for the purpose of practice. That this is a fun thing to discuss, so why don't we sit and discuss it? You know, oh, brother, what do you think about this? I think this, you think that, okay? There is no purpose of practicing. There is no purpose of trying to seek an answer for the purpose of the pleasure of Allah. So that's totally discouraged in the deen should not enter into gray areas for the purpose of seeing what, what how, how gray this looks. You should seek the black, you should, you should distinguish it from the white, and practice on that which is clear, and avoid that thing which is doubtful. That's the, the general principle of the Muslim. And there will always be things that, that are doubtful. That's human nature. Human nature is that, you know, the Quran cannot come and tell you every single thing A for Z. It provides principles, and you apply those principles. And sometimes you're right, and sometimes you're wrong. And that's why the muftis are there. That's their job. You know, We know that when the mufti makes their ijtihad and they're right, they get two rewards. One for making the ijtihad, one for being right. And if they're wrong, they got one reward. One for making the ijtihad. And notice that they don't get any sin for making a mistake. Because that's just part of the way the deen is made. It's principles. The Quran gives you principles and the world changes. And you have to apply those principles to a changing dynamic world. So that's the job of the muftis. But the muftis do it for the sake of Allah for the purpose of the community, not to have some academic intellectual discussions about things. So we should be careful about being among those that just seek to discuss for the purpose of discussing. And you know you know when you sit in the, in the, in the company of those people, it becomes very clear very quickly. وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَعْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهُ And now what's the purpose, what's, what's, the, what's the real issue? That you can't, you sit and discuss these ta'wil, you sit and discuss these interpretations, but you can never come to the answer because nobody knows them except Allah. And nobody knows the ta'wil of this except Allah. But as for those people who are deep in ilm, rasikhuna fil ilm means those people who are deep in ilm. But as for those people that are deep in ilm, what do they say when these discussions come up? Somebody comes to you and wants to have a random discussion and you're very knowledgeable. If you really have knowledge, you won't sit and even try to show them what you know. If you really have knowledge, this will be your response. What do they say? We believe in it. All of it's from our Lord. I don't know the answer to this, brother, but Allah said it in the Quran. I believe in the Quran, and it's true. Khalas. The discussion is done. Very simple statement. We believe in it. All of it is from our Lord. So, you know, people have this discussion, they say, Brother, what do you think? You think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He, uh, you know, that He, Yadullah, He foka aidihim, that His hand is over them, do you think Allah has a hand? We don't have those discussions. No need to discuss that. Okay? Wh whatever Allah said, Allah says, Yadullah, He foka aidihim, whatever He meant. If He meant that, you know, He meant it in a one way, then He meant it that way. If He meant it another way, He meant it that way. We have no idea. We have no we have no right to even make a discussion beyond that. Just simply Allah said this statement and blessed be Allah that He gave me the opportunity to recite this statement with my tongue. That's it. No discussion. The most dangerous thing to ever discuss aqidah. Sahaba never discussed aqaid. 
There was no such thing as aqidah at, at, at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The principles of aqidah they came up later when people began to alter the aqidah. Then they, the ulama had to come up with the aqidah because they had to counter the people from the outside that were saying things that were totally against the aqidah of Islam. We don't have these theoretical discussions about aqidah, you know. And there are many of them, and I'm not going to go into them, but we don't have these discussions, and we never ruminate on those things. The person who starts, you know, ruminating on these things, what happens is, shaitan will play with their mind. Once he gets you to have these types of discussions, then you start having very funny discussions. You start saying to yourself, oh, you know, okay, Allah created the world. Yes, I see that. So, okay, I, I created my, um, uh, I created this uh, cell phone. Uh, human beings created this cell phone, and then Allah created the human beings, so Allah must have created everything. But then who created Allah? Oh, wait a minute, let me think about that for a minute, that doesn't make sense. So what is this? This is just, I'm probably, I'm probably a lab rat sitting in a big experiment, and this is just one big experiment, and I'm a mouse moving around, and I don't realize that this is, I'm just as an investigator, and I'm just set up here, there's no such thing. You know, Shaitan starts putting all these crazy ideas in a person's mind. The one who starts ruminating on this, that becomes the fodder for, upon which Shaitan will start to play. We don't just, just, whenever these types of thoughts come in our mind, we say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, we don't even play with them. We don't even play with them. The moment they come in the mind, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, and you move on. You never let those types of thoughts sit. Again, same thing here. What did the people of knowledge say? They don't say, well, we've studied tremendously. Let's see, we can analyze this by looking A to Z to B, etc. So therefore, it must be this. No, you drop it. You just say one statement. Yukuluna amanna bihi. We believe in it. Kullum min indi rabbina. All of this is from our Lord. Wa ma yadhakkaru illa ulul albab. But the... But, but nobody takes heed, except the, the, but the, but among all, the only people that take heed are the ulul albab, the people of wisdom, the people of depth, the people of the core. You know what? The people of the core, they are the essence of the uh, of faith. They have the essentials of faith within them. They are the models of faith. These are the people that take heed. They recognize that it's dangerous to have such discussions because Shaban plays on such discussions and he uses it as a platform upon which he builds questions within a person's mind. They know what to discuss, they know what, what not to discuss. And again, I, I, one warning, one very big warning, that for Muslim, should be very careful about taking, you know, studying philosophies. You know, these theoretical things that people sit and discuss for the purposes of theory, those things are very dangerous. You have to be very, very well trained to involve yourself. And I can tell you, yes, you could study philosophy and it could advance you and you could become a very you know, Renaissance man, I don't have a doubt about it, but I can tell you I know so many people. From my own personal experience, they take a philosophy class, five years later, three years later, they leave the dean. They take a couple of these classes, and it puts funny thoughts in their mind, and they went there saying, I remember one brother came to me, he said, I want to take a philosophy class. I'm going to take it at the university, and it's called philosophy of religion. I said, you know, if you take that class, you are going to expose your, your religion to a very dangerous uh, attack. Why? Because psychologically and in a subversive way, ideas will come in your mind and shaitan will use them against you many, many years later. He said, no, 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 I'm taking this class because I want to learn the arguments of the Orientalists and this is going to protect Islam. I said, you know, even the most righteous scholar would be dead in the water in this type of class. You have to be very careful because it's presented in a very subtle way and it's presented without the background of faith and faith requires a certain amount of acceptance but philosophy never allows for acceptance. It always has an argument against an argument. He took the class. After he took the class, then maybe two years later, he started questioning. He started coming and asking me all these questions. And I could see the signs that he said, you know, well, you know, how, why do we have to believe in this? How do we really know that there was an angel in a cave? How do you really know? I said, what do you mean? I don't really know. I wasn't there. That's called faith. I have faith in this, I believe in it, I see that the world around me is too unique to be random, and I see that the human beings around me are too unique to be random. We're not all replicates of each other, but we're all unique. This has to be a sign that there was a creator. I, I accept that much. Once I know there's a creator and he told me he sent a messenger, and he's using all of these arguments that my mind understands, which is the diversity of creation, then I accept that messenger, and I believe in him with full faith. And beyond that, I can't say that I saw the angel there that day, he says, well, if you didn't see the angel there that day, it's easily that this was written. How do you know this wasn't written? So now you know, right? You know exactly where this is going. And then a year later, he comes to me and he left the dean. So it's not uncommon. And I can tell you I've seen more than one example of this. And the people that ha this hasn't happened to, then they come and they tell me, 
you know, that I have to talk to you. I said, why do you have to talk to me? They said that, you know, there's some very, very strange things going on in my life. So I sit down, I talk to them. They said that, you know, I, I, I'm very ashamed to say this, but I'm totally questioning the existence of Allah. And I've seen people say, I've seen more than one person come to me and say this. And I always can trace it back to some funny thing. Either they took their deen from a funny source, they decided to go study Islam from a person who wasn't a Muslim, or they took some sort of funny philosophy class, something like this, and they thought they were very tough. Because human beings think they're very tough. They say, what are you talking about? I'm not going to be affected by this. My faith is solid. We are not solid. We're barely surviving. Even the most righteous of us, we live too far away from the time of Rasulullah and too distant away from the place called Mecca and Medina. We are just at the edge. You know, if the tsunami comes, it takes us. We're not standing on high ground in that matter. You know, we're not sitting in front of Rasulullah watching Revelation. Nor are we sitting in Mecca and Medina watching people pray in, in front of the Kaaba. We're way off at the edge. And you know that the, the wolf, he takes the sheep at the edge. It doesn't go into the center. He takes the sheep at the edge. When the lion is chasing the deer, when the deers are doing their run through Africa and the lions are waiting, they don't go in the middle of the herd. They go right at the edge and they grab that deer and then they knock him out. So in the same way, Shafan takes from the edge. So we have to be very careful and recognize exactly who we are. We are not standing on firm ground. We are... We are barely surviving and we are fortunate to be who we are. So, again, if Allah is saying that the rasikhun fil end, that the people that are truly deep in end, they make this statement, then imagine what we're, we, where we should be. Then we now look at this. SubhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes the discussion. The discussion was between Rasulullah and Allah, and we were watching. Now the discussion changes into the first person. It's called iltifat in the Arabic language. It's in the linguistics that you switch person. Now, any of you that have ever written a paper for class, you know that if you switch person, the teacher puts red all over the paper. You can't say, he went to the store and then he did this and then she did this and then we said that. You can't do that. That's switching from second person to third person. You're not, or sorry, second person to first person. From third person to first person. You're not allowed to do that, right? Your teacher will mark the paper and say, don't switch person tense. Yet the Qur'an does this at points. And when the Qur'an does it, it's to give a very strong message. It's to draw your attention. So when person tense switches, very strong message comes. And here person tense switches. You switch all of a sudden to what? Dua. And who's making the dua? We're all making the dua. Rabbana la tuzikulubana ba'da id hadaytana. Now you start saying that if the rasikhun fil ilm, are actually in danger of losing their iman, if they don't make such a statement, then you automatically change now. And we all begin to make the dua, Rabbana la tuzikulubana ba'dayat hadaytana. Oh Allah, don't guide our hearts to crookedness. Don't make our hearts crooked ba'dayat hadaytana, after you have guided us. Ya Allah, do not make our hearts crooked, do not misguide our hearts after you have guided us. Wa hab lana min ladunka rahma. And grant from, and grant us from your grace, from your grace, and grant us from your grace guidance. Now look, I mean, guidance is that type of thing that can be taken at any minute. We don't make any claim to it. We don't say that it's ours. We don't say that we came from it. We don't say that it belongs to our family. We don't even say it belongs to our people. We, we just put it in the hands of Allah. We say, Ya Allah, grant it to us from your grace. وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً and grant from grant us from your grace your mercy. Innaka antal wahhab. You are the bestower. You are the bestower. You are the bestower. We are totally dependent on you. This is a very important du'a. And you know that people recite this du'a abundantly. It's a it's a protection for us. So we don't make any assumptions about our faith. We constantly ask from Allah, Rabbana la tuzqulubana ba'da id hadaytana. I mean, this is the du'a of the believer, right? Because we've been given something, we don't want it to be taken, and we know that anything else in the world can be taken, but we'll survive. You know, your house can be taken from you, you'll survive. Your money can be taken from you, you'll survive. Your kids could be taken from you, you'll have a very tough time, but you'll survive. Your life can be taken from you, it doesn't matter. But if your iman is taken from you, there is no replacement. There is no replacement. So this is the key du'a, and it's amazing the iltifat that's occurring here where we switch person tense all of a sudden. You know, they were saying, we were in third, we were in third person, yaquluna amanna, you know, well we, and they were saying, we believe in it, kullum min indi rabbina, all of this is from our Lord. And then third person again, wama yadhakkaru illa ulul albab, all third person. Now, boom, you switch into du'a, boom, you switch first person, and we come into the discussion. We are making the statement. 
ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues and the dua continues. Rabbana innaka jami'ul nas li yawmin la rayba fih. That, oh Allah, oh our Lord, you are the one that is going to gather together the people on a day in which there is no doubt within it. Now again, this is highlighting what? It's such a beautiful, the Quran, you know, the Quran you could, it's amazing that to me, that kids, you put this Nintendo and these things in their hand, they just will play with it for hours. And they will never get bored. It's such an ajib thing. And iPhone, you put it in the hand of an adult, or te- the text messaging and the iPhone and all this, and they can sit with their thumbs like this for hours and hours and hours. They just, they get addicted, and everybody gets addicted. You see the 80-year-old guy sitting at the bus stop like this, you know, and the, and the 20-year-old person sitting at the bus stop, and who do you think, the 80-year-old, who is he texting? He's got some other 80-year-olds that he's texting. And they're, what are they even talking about? Their life is near the edge. You know, my foot's in the grave, your foot's in the grave. <laughs> what are they sending back to each other? SubhanAllah. But this is the way the, the, these, these, these gadgets are. Now, the amazing thing about, about the Qur'an, that if you actually were to integrate yourself within it, it would just, in, it, would, it would take you the same way. It's so, it's so intricate, you know? Now look, we had this whole theme of what? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created human beings and they created, created human beings, you know, he fashioned them in the womb the way he desired, right? According to his program. And now what's coming? In this dua, the inverse of that is coming back, right? Rabbana, O oh our Lord, inna kajami nas, you are going to be gathering people you are going to gather people. Now, what does that mean? You're going to take people that have turned to dust and you're going to reprogram them with the same genetic apparatus that you initially programmed them with, but it's going to be in the reverse. You're going to make Zayd back out of dust when he started from a clot of blood or a single cell. So it's like the complete reverse. You know, you went all the way this way. You were a single drop. You were created. You were dropped into the dust. That same drop from the dust, that same genetic material will be recreated so that Zayd exists back at his peak. Now, of course, the shape and the form will be different, but it'll be Zayd in the end. You know, it'll be Bakr in the end. And that's the intricacy of the Qur'an, that it takes a theme, establishes it, picks it up, puts it back down, reverses it, and then drags you back and establishes the exact point that it wants to establish. It's like one of the miracles. of It's a, liter, it's a literature miracle. It's a, liter, it's a miracle of the literacy of the Qur'an. The way it... In so many places it does this. And so again, it's doing it here. Now, what is it warning us about? That the same reverse creation that will take a person from dust and raise them again, it will raise them for a purpose, however. The same way that the initial creation occurred in order to establish the human being in a test upon which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would judge them on the day of judgment, the reverse creation will put them back to take the result of that test. Ajeeb. You know, that they were created in one way to be tested, that test was written, now the results of that test have to be given. They were destroyed in the process. They'll be regenerated. Then the results of the test will be bestowed upon them. Where? <laughs> For that day which there is no doubt. Now, Ajib, when it comes to the discussion of that day, now look, we went back for a second, right? We were talking about doubt. We were talking about those people that have crookedness and doubt within their heart. See how all these themes are coming back together. We were discussing crookedness and doubt, begging not to be among those that have crookedness and doubt, and then what's being slapped upon us? There is a day upon which there will be no doubt. SubhanAllah. There will be no doubt about that day that we will be raised and our grade will be given to us. You know? Now you know that when you take an exam, you take the exam, you leave the room, and then the next thing you ask is, what did I get? Right? And you're, you want to know, you want to know, you want to know what you got. And you think... Constantly, what is my score? Okay, I think about that question. I must have got that one right. Let me think about it again. Let me ask my friend about it, etc. That's the exact same way that we are. We should be constantly thinking about what is our score going to be on the Day of Judgment. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clear that not only will this day be certain, and not only will, be, will we be raised again in order to stand on that day, in Allah la yukhliful mi'ad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not break His covenant does not break his, his pact. This is a pact, and it's been established, that you have been created for a test, and that you will be removed, but you will be re-raised on a day in which there is no doubt 
for the answer to that test, for the results of that test. So there should be no doubt in your mind. So basically, this is the answer to all doubts. You know, if you sit there and start ruminating on these notions that, well, if, you know, who, who am I? Well, was, I, was the Quran really revealed in a cave on a man and I wasn't there to see it, so how can I believe it? It doesn't matter. You don't, you don't need to be there to see it. You just need to know one thing. You're going to die and Allah will raise you. And that's actually what it boils down to. It doesn't matter how you, how you come to any conclusions. This is the final result. You know, and that's what, there's a, there's a famous uh, philosophical argument that ends all of the philosophies, which is that, look, in the end, there's two possibilities. One possibility is that all of this is made up, and we don't, you know, all of this was made up, and we're simply just following it, okay? So what's the worst case scenario in that case? You believe it, you lived a good life, you did good, you practiced good, you were at peace with yourself, you die, and there's nothing after, okay? Let's just say, theoretically, for the purpose of argument, you, you take that. Fine, so you didn't lose anything. But let's take the opposite argument. The opposite argument is that there is a hereafter, and you will be judged. Then, if you did not prepare yourself for it, you're totally in trouble, right? I mean, then you come out the loser. So in the end, even philosophically, that's the final argument, which is that we're all going to die. There is no denying that. No philosopher can ever say that you won't die. Everybody agrees on this point. It's the one point that all human beings do agree on. You will be dead. You have a limited period of time. You cannot change that. You cannot be here more than a certain period of time. 200 years from now, forget about 200. 100 years from now, everybody in this room will not be here. There might be one or two, but we, most of us will not be here. There will be a whole other new group of people sitting. And there's no denying that. So there's two possibilities. Either you can assume that, you know, that there is nothing after this life, and then what? So you pass away, but you were going to pass away anyway. You didn't lose anything. You simply lived a good life. You lived a balanced life. You were at peace with yourself. You did good. Or there really is a hereafter. And there is no doubt about that hereafter. And then you're really going to be in trouble. Because now there will, you will be passing away and there will be a Jannah and Jahannam in front of you. And you will end up in one place permanently. So which gamble would you take? I mean, I think that makes, very, that makes obvious sense as well. But anyway, the point for the believer is we don't have any doubts about this. And we don't play games with these types of ideas, right? We don't let doubt even come into the corner of our heart. We simply, we simply push it away. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. So anyway, this is the statement being made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're actually going to start a new, a little bit of a new theme on the next verse. So I don't want to go into that at this point. Um, so we'll close with that. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who appreciate the fact that he is the only deity worthy of worship. May he make us among those who understand the reality of the fact that he is al-hayyum qayyum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who appreciate that we are standing on the firm foundation of a, of a, of a faith and practice that has existed for thousands of years. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us firm upon it. May He make us recognize the fact that we are coming from a tradition that has, that has the greatest of creation within it, and namely, namely the prophets. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who have the opportunity to access those people who are rasikun fil ilm. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who recognize that there is no, that there is no doubt about that final day. سبحان الله وبحمده سبحان الله العظيم